Immigration was one of the biggest issues in the 2016 referendum, and some people believe that it was a major reason why Brexit won that referendum. Recently, it has come back into the frame politically on account of the large numbers of asylum seekers using small boats, some of them to their deaths, uh, crossing the channel. And the government earlier this week has announced plans to deal with this issue. It does seem that their priority is to combat the sense that they have lost control over immigration, because it was, of course, the claim of taking back control that was absolutely central to the case for Brexit that was made in 2016 and in 2019. I'm now going to be discussing this issue and the government's latest measures with Brendan Donnelly, the director of the Federal Trust. Brendan, the government has announced new plans to deal with the crossing of the channel by asylum seekers. What do you make of this? Do, is it likely to succeed what they're proposing? Well, as you know, there's been a lot of criticism of this bill, uh, and I think most of the criticism is well-founded. I think it's inhumane in its conception. I think it's intellectually confused. Uh, I think it's um, almost certainly in breach of international law and obligations. Um, and I very much doubt whether it's going to succeed even in its own terms. What are the essential provisions that the government is seeking to, to, to put through? Well, the essential provision is that uh, if you arrive in what they describe as an illegal manner, essentially coming by boat, um, you won't qualify for um, asylum. Uh, however strong your case may be, um, you will simply be um, uh, refused the asylum. You won't ever be able to get British um, citizenship. Um, and in theory, at least, you're going to be repatriated to some other country although it's very unclear what that other country might be. You don't think that people have been making too much of this, because it does seem that the chances of this actually being able to work, um, either in its own terms by being able to find a country that can take the repatriation in a manner that is consistent with international law, or indeed in terms of the opposition that it's likely to receive in the House of Lords. I think that's entirely possible. But I don't take much um, uh, comfort from it. Uh, I think it's a, a very worrying development of our political culture that we can have such a, uh, an inhumane and uh, co in confused, um, uh, internationally illegal bill put forward by the government um, and welcomed, apparently, by a large proportion of the Conservative Party uh, and by the Conservative press. Um, I rather agree with Gary Lineker that there are aspects of the present debate um, which are uncomfortably reminiscent of, of opinion forming in, um, in 1930s Germany. Uh, it represents a, a degradation of our political society, um, which uh, can't carry on indefinitely without irreparable, perhaps irreparable harm being done. But is this uh, issue really the one that is decisive in terms of the, of the government trying to um, create political space between it and the Labour Party and to brand the Labour Party as in some way pro-immigration because asylum seeking is actually a very small part of the overall issues of, of, of immigration that were raised during the referendum campaign and thereafter. In 2016, there was a, a deliberate or ignorant conflation of, of two propositions, uh, Immigration, economic immigration, might or might not be um, uh, excessive, and asylum seekers. Uh, for many people, the, there is no clear intellectual distinction um, in the political debate of this country between asylum seekers uh, uh, and immigrants. Uh, I think that the, the, the government um, does attach importance in its self-presentation to this issue of of getting a handle as they see it or will present it um, on immigration. Uh, it's, a, it's a familiar tactic of unsavory governments that they attempt to create external enemies and enemies within, if you like, um, in order to distract attention away from their, their, their failings at home. And I think that's very much what the government has done. It's, um, uh, it's talked up 
um, uh, as if it were a crisis, um, a problem for the British state. Um, and it does so in terms which draw lines in the mind of the government between the patriots themselves who are reflecting the popular will um, and the, the elites, the, the people who are trying to frustrate the political will, the will of the country. Um, Suella Braverman has used some uh, appallingly reckless rhetoric in this context, a uh, 100 million um, uh, possible refugees uh, and uh, uh, the frustration of the democratic will of the government by lefty lawyers. Um, this is the, the, the rhetoric of, of, of division um, and resentment and even hatred, um, and it can't carry on indefinitely without, um, without consequences. Coming back to the bill itself, I mean, it does seem that it runs the risk, at least, of breaking international law. I mean, it's slightly curious that the government felt impelled to uh, address the issue of the Northern Irish Protocol and to drop the bill uh, that would have breached uh, the international agreement that we had with the European Union uh, because they were frightened of the commercial consequences of being a lawbreaker in that context. But they now seem to be immediately rushing into being lawbreakers in, in another context and one which could indeed have some impact on the Northern Irish Agreement because of the place of the European Court of Human Rights in the Good Friday Agreement. Would you like to comment on that? Yes, I think there are several stages to this argument. Uh, I, I think... Um, the two um, episodes, the Northern Ireland uh, Agreement and this bill, really have to be seen together. Uh, I think that uh, Rishi Sunak um, disturbed um, some of the elements in the Conservative Party, which are not particularly well disposed to him anyway, um, by the Northern Ireland Agreement. Uh, now he has to reassure them by going ahead with something that um, is a bit of red meat for the for the extreme Eurosceptic wing of the Conservative Party. Um, it certainly breaks international law. It uh, dismantles most of the asylum protection elements of, of international agreements. I even the government themselves seem to accept that, although they're, they're, they're incoher in inconsistent in what they say about it. Sometimes they say it may break international law. Sometimes they say it does. Uh, interestingly, there was a, a tweet from Rishi Sunak on this subject, warning people who came here, as he put it, illegally, that they wouldn't have access to the UK's modern slavery system. Um, he presented it almost as if it were the equivalent of the National Health Service, um, something that um, people want to want to come and take advantage of. Trouble with those immigrants, they're all coming here to take advantage of our modern modern um, slavery system. Um, perhaps he's only offering them an older slavery system. I don't know, but it, it's a good example of the uh, of the the intellectual coherence incoherence of this bill. But do you think it's possible that the UK could actually withdraw from the European Court of Human Rights? I think there's always been a, a, an important wing of the Conservative Party that, that wanted to do that. And I think they wanted to do it because they they have two related um, ideas in their mind. One, we don't want to be told what to do um, by foreign justices, foreign judges who probably aren't real judges anyway. They may be professors of law or, or, or whatever. They, they haven't gone through the British system of, um, uh, 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 of legal evolution. They don't understand common law. That, that's one common complaint. Um, the, the, the other complaint is that um, uh, sovereignty of the United Kingdom can only be exercised entirely free of any constraint. It's uh, it's imperial thinking, and uh, I think that while many of today's Brexiters would reject that uh, analysis, it, it is true um, that for them the the perfect state of um, uh, of the United Kingdom will be a, a country free of any sort of restraint, any constraint, any need to compromise with anyone or anything. Um, it's a it's an unrealistic view of self sovereignty. Probably it was never a realistic view, and it's certainly unrealistic in the twentieth and twenty first century. Whether the government, this government, will go so far uh, as to renounce the um, European Convention on Human Rights, I ra rather rather doubt. Um, I think that the pressure from the Americans would be very great not to do it. Principally because of, of its role in the architecture of the Northern Art of the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, it will be to break the Good Friday Agreement to leave the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and I don't think the Americans are, are going to allow um, the British government to get away from with it. Um, Sunak was, was evasive 
um, on the subject uh, of whether he would be prepared to leave the convention. And, and I think that it, it's another example of the way in which um, the nearer someone comes to power, um, in the case of even Johnson, the more they understand that, that there are restraints on the exercise of that power and that uh, it's all very well for the ERG um, to be complaining in the background, but but they don't have to rule, rule, rule the country in the same way Sunak does. Do you think that immigration more generally is going to become a larger issue in British politics as the economy becomes more difficult? I and mean, that's often been the case in the past. I think it's entirely possible. Um, it, it's very much a uh, in the playbook of the unsavoury regimes of the 20th century um, that uh, immigrants of one kind or another the other people who are not regarded as being uh, authentically um, uh, nationally reliable um, are, are seen as, uh, as scapegoats. Um, uh, and that, I think, is, is a danger uh, of British politics uh, over the coming years. Um, this idea of division between us and them, us being the British and them being the people who are the non-British, and then division even within the the, the British themselves, uh, the people who authentically represent the voice of the people uh, and those who don't because they're woke liberal lefty lawyers. Uh, I do see that as being a possibility. And I think that it's one of the reasons why this is so concerning, uh, the bill and the rhetoric which has accompanied it. Some people think that this whole exercise on immigration um, has been to draw attention away from um, the the Sue Gray uh, case and the whole question surrounding Boris Johnson's uh, future and the um, examination of what went on during uh, the COVID crisis and lockdown and all the rest. Uh, do you think that's true? I think it's slightly different from that. I, I, I think that the um, the Conservative Party uh, is hoping to draw attention away from its own problems by concentrating on the Sue Gray issue. Um, it's quite extraordinary that she is now presented as being a, an enemy of the Conservative Party when uh, at the time of her report, it was widely praised by the Conservative Party um, as exculpating or at least not particularly incriminating towards, towards Johnson. This is a, a sensational rewriting of the past. It's almost a, a, at the level of the Soviet Union in the 1930s. Uh, they used to say in this famous Soviet joke, um, the, the future is certain, only the past is unpredictable. Perhaps it's uh, appropriate that we should echo from the 1930s in the Soviet Union um, the, the remark of Gary Lineker's, which I began by citing about 1930s Germany. Finally, something which we have discussed on, on several occasions is the internal debate the Conservative Party, between the two types of Brexiteers, the, the liberal free market Singapore on Thames uh, brigade and uh, those who favour much more a, a fortress Britain uh, protectionist vision of what Brexit should be about. Where does this case leave that debate? Because clearly the, the fortress Britain uh, Brexiteers have been very hostile to immigration and made that a major issue, whereas the Singapore on Thames Brexiteers have tended to favour uh, a, a more open policy towards immigration, a uh, view of a global immigration policy. I think this is uh, a victory, if you like, or, or a bone um, thrown towards uh, the fortress Britain uh, end of the argument. Um, but it's only one battle which has been won in a, a continuing war. I think within the Conservative Party, the two wings that you've described are, are pretty evenly balanced. Perhaps the fortress um, Britain people are a bit more numerous, uh, but the um, Singapore on Thames people uh, are more determined. Uh, they're more intellectually coherent in some ways, and they've got a lot of the courtier press uh, on their side. So there's always going to be uh, a standoff between those two elements in the Conservative Party, and we'll be able to point to individual pieces of legislation or individual initiatives as favouring one side rather than the other. Uh, but it's a fundamental stasis, which is a, a legacy uh, of Brexit, because Brexit was sold to different people 
um, on diff with different prospectuses and sometimes with um, contradictory prospectuses. And Fortress Britain and, and Singapore on Thames are, are certainly contradictory prospectuses. Um, people sometimes talk about um, Dominic Cummings as being a, a political genius, a tactical genius. One thing he did get right, it was much easier to win the referendum in 2016 when people could believe in contradictory uh, ideas about the future of the of the United Kingdom um, than if there had been a, a clear future spelt out, which could never have got, gained uh, any sort of majority for the Leave campaign. Well, Brendan, thank you very much for that. No doubt we will be continuing these discussions again in due course. Thank you.